Hey everyone, welcome back to Words and Other Good Ideas. Today I'm going to be reviewing Terry Goodkind's Wizard's First Rule, which is the first book in the Sword of Truth series. So Wizard's First Rule was published in 1994, and it was Terry Goodkind's first ever attempt at publishing a book, and he actually managed it within ten weeks, which is literally unheard of in uh, for new authors especially. And he topped records of, of biggest advances, and it really goes to show how appreciated this book was when it came out. Because Wizard's First Rule was written in the 90s, it's very, very classic fantasy. It's good versus evil, there's dark magic, there are good wizards, bad wizards, there's sort of a looming evil threat, and there are dragons involved. It's really, it's it's everything you've ever wanted fantasy to be, and it's all included in the book. So it begins by introducing the protagonist, Richard Cipher, who is in the woods, he's looking for a particular type of plant, and he's just sort of hunting around and from a vantage point he sees on the path below a woman um, walking along very purposefully and he's curious about her and then he also notices that she is being followed by four very scary looking men, you know, they're huge, they're armed, aggressive and they seem to be sort of hunting her. So he sort of freaks out because <laughs> he lives in a very secluded place and he's never seen anything close to that type of predatory violence so he doesn't really know what to do but he decides sort of immediately that the men are the aggressors and that the woman needs to be rescued. The book is set in a completely original world and Richard is from one of the three areas. He's from Westland which is unsurprisingly in the west. The three areas of the world are divided by boundaries and the boundaries are magic. They were thrown up by a wizard a long time ago and no one really understands them but they're guarded by boundary wardens and you can't really go in them, you just die. But as it turns out, Colan has managed to come through the boundary into Westland from the area called Midlands and she basically introduces Richard Cipher to all of the problems that the Midlands are having and he, she dumps them all on him and he sort of undertakes to save her because she persuades him and another person persuades him and they go off together journeying and attempt to save the world from an evil wizard called Dark and Ra. And Richard is then sucked into this adventure where he learns all sorts of different lessons and discovers himself and is given power that he never wanted and grows into a man. So it's very much a sort of coming of age story. I mean, he doesn't come of age, but he sort of becomes more than he was and grows up basically and is introduced to things that he never he never thought he needed to be introduced to and experiences things that he would never have experienced if he'd stayed in his own world. Um, and these things include sort of graphic graphic scenes. There's sex in the book, there is a hefty amount of torture as well um, in this first book of the series. So that is disturbing. When I say that this is a story about a young man, I don't want anyone to think that this is a story for children. Really what it's about is is learning lessons, and that is where the title of the book sort of comes into play. It's a really long series, and the premise is that each book explains, sort of demonstrates, one of the wizard's rules. They're very, very good rules. They're applicable to actual life. Um, so. The rule in the first book is that people are stupid, and this is explained as being um, people will believe whatever they want to believe and whatever they fear to believe, and you can sort of manipulate people into into doing things just by showing them something that they want or something that they fear, and that's what they'll believe because people are stupid. Um, and this rule comes into play a lot in the first book, and it's demonstrated in a lot of different ways, and the characters make really really good use of it and it's a really good premise actually I think for a series. Um, educational texts have a very long history. I think Terry Goodkind has done a really really good job of taking this really old tradition in literature and making it modern and original and making it fun as well. You know, you're reading the series, you don't really realise that you're learning things. Um, within the series, mentioned in the background a few times, there is a book called The Adventures of Bonnie Day, which is about a group of sort of children, teenagers, who go off on an adventure and make loads of mistakes. And the purpose of that book, within the book, is to 
sort of educate the reader on the mistakes that you can make if you're not careful. Richard uses his knowledge of that book within the book, the Sword of Truth series, to avoid making loads of mistakes. So there's a nice bit of mirroring for you um, on Terry Goodkind's part. Well done, Terry Goodkind, for doing that. Now there are a number of problems with the book and with the series as a whole, and when I was doing some research for this video I came across a number of reviews where people are sort of reacting really really negatively to problems which I don't see as problems at all and are ignoring the things which I think are bigger issues. The first problem that I have is that Richard Cipher is too perfect quite often. Um, and this is a problem which I have a problem with being a problem that doesn't make any sense. This is a problem which is sort of difficult to describe because the whole point of Richard's character is that he is the perfect person to do the job that he's given um, and that's why he's chosen for it, that's why he's able to do it, is because he is the perfect person, history has been awaiting him, he's fulfilling his destiny um, in the position that he's he's been put. So it's kind of difficult to say that Terry Goodkind has made a mistake in making Richard too perfect, but the feeling is still there. All throughout the series um, there, there are massive problems, the world is in danger, and then Richard finds a way to save it. When you're reading the books it's it's not like you can anticipate what Richard is going to do to save the world. Um, so, for example, the reason people like to read detective stories is because they're given all of the information in the book to solve the problem, and the challenge is to see if you can solve it before the detective does, and I think that's why people like to read that type of story. And the problem that I have with these books is that you never, you can never anticipate the ending, you can never make the logical leaps that Richard does, and you can't see exactly how he's going to save the world. He sort of just comes out with this opinion, this new opinion of how magic works and and it does because it's him that says it rather than because those are the rules of magic. Another problem that I have is with Goodkind's use of exposition. Now exposition is a vital part of any, any book um, but especially fantasy. It's when the author uses a character to teach another character about something. So uh, you've got Zed the wizard who is obviously an expert in wizardry things. He, he knows magic and he knows how it works and he knows um, what the evil wizard is doing and why he's doing it. You've got Kalan who knows all about the politics of the Midlands and the world and a lot about history and she knows about languages and different societies. And you've got Richard who makes logical leaps that no one else can make and he sees connections that no one else can see and he also knows a lot about woods and plants and how to hunt and stuff like that. So whenever these characters need to explain something to another, what they're actually doing is explaining to the reader. You see this literally everywhere in literature. Any book where someone is learning something or has travelled to a foreign land or is somehow inducted into a new society or literally literally anything where anyone is being taught anything that is a plot device and the author has only done it to explain it to you even if it's the basis of the entire book he has used the plot to explain his world that he has created to you the problem that i have is that in this book you can have characters explaining something for a page or two pages without interruption and it disrupts the the way that conversations should work in a text and it doesn't really sit right. The other big problem which shows up in the series as a whole, not really so much in the first book but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it, is that the series becomes a very obvious allegory for communism versus capitalism. There is a large other country who is ruined by by people sort of having to share and and basically all the communist values are, are taken out of context and and shown in the worst possible light and it's very American and as a not American I don't I don't 
<clears throat> I don't really sympathise with the author's seeming views on that. But it is actually quite a good explanation of the problems that communism can have, and it's a fascinating insight into the American psyche as well, so there's a plus side. But for, for the book, um, it doesn't really do anything for me, and it, it again, it annoys me just every time it shows up. Now, when I was doing my research for this video, I came up against a lot of videos that said that they had a problem with how classic, for lack of a better word, for how classic this this book and this series is, um, and how sort of strictly it goes along with things that are, that are known for fantasy, and I really don't understand this view, this sort of negative attitude towards fantasy things in a fantasy series. I really don't understand it, they're, they're sort of taking issue with the fact that there are dragons in the book when there are dragons in loads of fantasy books and that's one of the classic things of fantasy and I could sort of understand this if this book had been published a year ago but this book was published in the 90s in classic fantasy time it's like picking up a Dickens book and taking issue with it because it's wordy and it's not got any feminist views in it when obviously you can't expect that of a Dickens book. Dickens was being paid per word, so obviously he's going to chuck in a few extra words where they're not really needed, and he lived in a time when the most feminist man there was probably only, you know, thanked his wife when she made him a sandwich. It's ridiculous. You can't, you can't take issue with fantasy books for having fantasy things in them. It's, I really, really don't understand it, and if anyone can explain this to me in the comments, then please do so. It's really making me angry, actually, because this is one of my favourite books and one of my favourite series. It's not like there's nothing else to the plot. It's not like he's just gone on a merry adventure and and stumbles across dragons. You know, the good thing about the book is that it takes all of those things um, that are classic and sort of reworks them into an original plot. And it is a very original plot. I've heard a lot of people say that it's it's taken things from Wheel of Time and other books and and it's just, you know, unoriginal and uninspired and it's it's really not and those people have either just read the first book and have made a lot of assumptions or they have based their review on other people's reviews and haven't actually read any of it themselves. I basically had my mind blown by by how well written the series is over so many books. Really, really good. Really, really, really good. They're all sort of tied together and and you learn so much and I just love them. I, I just do. I'm going to recommend this book toward people who like fantasy, perhaps haven't read a huge amount of fantasy. Definitely for people who are not going to be intimidated by a very long, very very long series. These books are very easy to read one by one with other things in between, you know, you can dip in and out. Um, there's there's an overarching plot, obviously, because it's a connected series, but each book deals with a minor plot that ties into the whole, so it's very satisfying to read one, and there aren't massive cliffhangers that make you want to reach for the next book immediately, if that makes sense. So don't be put off by how many books there are. Just read the first one. Just pick that one up and you'll want to read the rest of them, to be honest. That's all I can say. Um, so I'm giving Wizard's First Rule a 7.5 out of 10. I'm giving the series as a whole a 7 out of 10 because there are some books that bring it down a little. Um, but Wizard's First Rule is a really, really good introduction and just a really, really good it's it's nostalgic in a way of of my youth and i can't think of it without getting happy again despite you know the torture and the evilness and stuff so just read it just read it and if you've liked this video then leave a comment message me on twitter and like share and subscribe